This world is real because God upholds it by the word of his power. You've laughed because he gave you laughter. You've cried because you're not just a bunch of flying molecules here by random chance for no purpose whatsoever. You cry at loss because love and feelings and emotions and joy and all these things are real because God designed them to be so. Why? Because you're made in his image. Well, that's a rather large mess. How does it follow that physically sourced emotions exist? Therefore, God. There's a massive gap one has to traverse to get from point A to point B. Fun fact, our emotions exist as a product of a naturally guided physical process known as evolution. Yes, the universe being here may be random. It may not. We don't know the specifics yet. But either way, evolution isn't some random process. As for the whole just a bunch of flying molecule shtick, everything you've ever known has just been matter and energy. Just the material. There has never been some non-material element to the universe ever observed. So as far as we know, all wonder, all meaning, all joy that has ever existed has been the result of just a bunch of flying molecules. So it would seem that it's not said molecules asserted in capability, but rather you observed incredulity, that's a real problem here. Anyway, today's video is a response to The Hypocrisy of Atheism by The Response Church. Let's get down to business. Richard Dawkins and all these atheists can say all day long that there's no purpose for in the world at all. We're just flying molecules. We're just stardust. And yet they weep when their parents die. Because they're made in the image of a triune God who has dwelt in perfect relationship for an eternity. For an eternity. First of all, show me where Richard Dawkins has stated that there is no meaning or purpose to life. Because all I know of is Dawkins stating that there's no dictated meaning pushed on us. Like the meaning of a dissatisfied adult pushed onto their child as an attempt to parasitically live through them by proxy. Regardless of the child's own hopes or dreams. And either way, what Dawkins thinks is irrelevant to what I think. A fact that I've been meaning to mention for a long time is that the only book I've read from the well-known atheist out there was Christopher Hitchens' The Missionary Position, which by the way is less book, more an investigative journalism piece. It kind of reads like a long article. Outside of a few debates, most of the content by Dawkins et alia that I've read or viewed has been as a result of apologists asserting Atheist X said this, and I just want to check what they actually stated. Fact is, I hold to meaning, just not your idea of dictated meaning. I hold to personal meaning, explored meaning, the meaning that gives our life significance because we feel said significance, not because some man screaming from behind the pew says we should. As for crying at the loss of a loved one, where is the atheist hypocrisy? And by atheist, I think I should specify that I'm on about the secular humanist type atheist, the sort this man is screeching on about. I don't hold to the existence of an afterlife. To me, this is my one life, the only life I shall ever have, and the same is true for those around me. So when I lose someone, I actually lose them, and that loss fills me with great sorrow. My friends and family are important to me, when I lose something important, that makes me sad. So where is the contradiction here? If you want to talk about what's odd, how about we talk about the way in which Christians proclaim to know that heaven exists for certain? And on top of that, I've never met a Christian who thought a loved one wasn't going to heaven. So why then do they cry? Do they mourn? Do they share every single emotion that I as an atheist who believes I will no longer see said person, also have. Surely they should be happy that their loved one is now in heaven. And yes, whilst there is sorrow in being temporarily separated, that sorrow is completely at odds with the proportional sorrow seen at the grave side of all Christians I have ever met. It should be a little sorrow in see you soon. So why then is it treated by Christians with the full-on grief of goodbye forever? So when we scratch the surface, not only do we see a complete lack of contradiction or hypocrisy on part of the atheist, we discover that this assertion is simply projection on part of the apologist. 
They desire relationship. They can't escape it because they're made in the image of a triune God, one God in three persons in perfect love forever. How does wanting to have relationships in any way link to your beliefs about the Trinity? What we actually observe is the fact that we're a social species and, as a part of that, we not only form relationships for our mutual benefit, but have evolved complicated emotions as part of said relationships. No god or any sort of magic required. So again, I'm failing to see the apparent hypocrisy when all you're doing is making empty assertion after empty assertion. This world is real, brothers and sisters, and it's real because God says so. Since the dawn of time, people have said there is no God. They have viewed the same evidence that we all observe with masterfully crafted eyeballs set back into their face, fascinating facial structure. And yet they look at the same evidence that we're all observing and they say, there's no intention. There's no God. There's no design. Why? Because they hate him. They do not want to be held accountable to this God. They hate his holiness. They hate his righteousness. And what we're going to find out later in Jonah is that they hate his steadfast love. I see that the Christian staple of lying about their critics hasn't died down at all. This is pure, unadulterated crap. I don't believe in your God because I have no justifiable reason to believe in God. And neither do you. If you did you or some other Christian would supply said basis. But instead, all you can actually do is not only lie about what we think, but what we observe. Take the eye. The human eye is total shit, at least from a design perspective. When studied, it was discovered that the vertebrate retina is inverted. That is, the light-sensitive photoreceptors are located at the back of the retina, whilst layers of neurons and capillaries are located at the front. Now thankfully, this doesn't degrade our vision directly. Yet there is one problem. Since the neurons linked to said photoreceptors exist at the front of the photoreceptors, how do they get the information they receive to the brain where it can be processed? Well, they form a break in the retina, a hole through which the nerve fibers can pass. This hole results in a blind spot, an area which cannot receive information since there are no photoreceptors there as the nerve fibers pass through it. Now compare our eyes to cephalopods. Their retinas have the photoreceptors at the front with the neurons and capillaries behind them. Some creatures such as the octopus actually have a very similar eye setup to our own. The only major difference being that due to the retina structure, they don't require a hole in said photoreceptors to pass on information and subsequently lack a blind spot. So why the difference? Well, this is a product of evolution. You see, evolution, whilst not random, is also not some sentient designer. Evolution operates incrementally, selecting for traits that benefit survival over many different stages, of which we have documented very well with the eye. All the way from light-sensing pigments to eyes such as ours or those of the octopus. The thing about this process is, unlike a designer, it has to make do with what it has. Unlike a designer who can rub out a mistake and start again, or hell, just avoid mistakes by being all-knowing, evolution can't do that. So at the point our ancestors evolved an inverted retina, every subsequent generation, species and individual that branched from that initial population has had to evolve with that blind spot a fact that completely validates naturalistic evolution whilst eviscerating any kind of competent design. Forget all-knowing and all-powerful design, the eye doesn't even show a basic level of competence, so that goes right out the window. So way to prove that you know jackal about what you're asserting is true. As for everything else, yes, we have the same evidence. And what that evidence has shown us thus far is that Everything that has ever been observed and studied has turned out to not be the result of magic. So why would I have to believe in magic? You may doubt his word in scripture. You may doubt the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You may doubt the Genesis or Jonah narrative, but your doubts don't change reality one bit. You will live according to his spoken word, whether you reject it or not. 
Tomorrow you may say, I just don't know if Christianity is true. The dude dwelled in a fish for three days. Yet in that moment, you are fulfilling his very word, clinging to lifeless idols, the presuppositions of finite men who talk about logic and rationale, but where did they get these things but from the God who gave them to him? Secular philosophy? What? Did you think that was some sort of impressive gotcha moment? Well, it's not. It's just more pure assertion, as has been everything in this video thus far. You point to something random and go, God did it. That's just childish and it certainly doesn't show a hypocrisy in those wanting actual evidence for the existence of God before they start believing in said God. It just proves that apologists cling to their ignorance, which, big whoop, I already knew that and I'm pretty sure so did my viewers. As for idols, I don't have any idols. I have people I routinely listen to because they have something interesting to say, a fact that cannot be said about you and your scripture. All we get from either of you is the same old ignorance repackaged and branded as the truth. Your religion is just the margarine of reality. At least it would be if margarine was really packaged feces. You say, I just can't believe it isn't reality. Well I fucking can and so can anyone with the slightest intellectual integrity. And if I'm seeming cruel here it's because I detect that this person has no intention of talking about us in good faith. So, I'm just going for all-out Christian barbecue by this point. To the Christian who doubts in such ways, you doubt the Jonah narrative, you doubt the Genesis narrative, I assure you, you have a merciful Savior. He died for your doubts that stem from your sinful unbelief. It is sin to doubt God. And yet he is merciful to, to die for such sin but may we turn from our sin and trust him and take him at his word. So my disbelief, which, if they do indeed exist, stems from the failure of your God and their followers to supply even the most basic evidence of their existence, is a sin. That to me sounds a lot like your God trying to blame me for their massive fuck up, which, let's not forget the full context, is used to justify the eternal torture that apparently awaits me when I die. To that I simply say, piss off, you bloody charlatan. Like seriously, you want to dance about and pretend like there's some hypocrisy to be found in not accepting the crap you spew in an uncritical fashion. The reality meanwhile is that the only hypocrisy to be found here is your own glaring hypocrisy on multiple fronts. Not only do you project your weaknesses onto us, but you actually settle on willingly lying about what we think as a means of personal attack. And I have to ask, you pretend like you want to bring us into your ignorant belief system, but is that really true? I say this because the first thing you should know about having a conversation in good faith is that any prospect for such dies the very moment you start inventing crap about the other side, going full Freud on them and claiming that they don't believe because they hate God. Uh. I acknowledge Donald Trump exists even though he's a fucking disgrace on humanity. You see, even if I actually believe God to genuinely exist, which I don't, I could still do so without worshipping them. Their existence does not compel obedience, only belief. So yeah, it's amazing to see someone fuck up as much as you do in a video that was less than 3 minutes long. But I've gotta say, I am far from impressed. Hi there, I'd just like to say a few things here at the end of the video. First, I'd like to thank everyone who's ever donated to the channel via Patreon, giving a special thanks to the following people. Hannah Banghart, Matthew Kovac, John Schoenrock, Daniel Martinez, Ernst Puna, and Alexander Williams. Your support has ensured this channel its ability to grow over the years and really is the only thing that manages to keep the channel afloat. I'd also like to ask that you comment down below and like this video as well as subscribe and follow Essence of Thought on both Facebook and Twitter. Please also consider following Atheist Alliance International on Facebook, an organisation dedicated to helping atheists around the globe. Any comments utilising language which insults others on the basis of perceived gender, sexuality, ethnicity or ability both mental and physical will be removed immediately and the commenter may be blocked on the moderator's discretion. Let's keep this space one which upholds the humanist values. 
Thank you.